Sexually confused Prime Minister of Australia, Tony Abbott. Welcome to the Herd Mentality Podcast. With me, Peter Bogosian, standing in for Adam Reeks, who doesn't want to speak with you. Ever. I don't want to play word games with you. Sorry, Tony. That's just not how this works. Now let's discuss your credentials. You are the foremost expert in Australia regarding... Endless naval gazing and uh, musical chairs when it comes to leadership. Couldn't have said it better myself. Now, you've long been in staunch opposition to progress and keeping up with other first world countries when it comes to the issue of gay marriage. I just don't think that marriage is the right term to put on it. Be that as it may, today's headlines have been leading us to think that perhaps you have some interesting sexual kinks. If you want to talk about it, I'm not going to run away from that. Excellent. Let's delve into the real Tony. First, as the most flexible man in politics, rumored to be able to bend himself in half, your position on self-flagellation... I've never been someone uh, to blow my own trumpet. I guess I'm sorry about that. Now... It's rumored that the one time you did try such a maneuver, there was some sort of soft tissue damage. Plainly, we did bite off more than we can chew in some important respects. Ooh, ouch. Well, let's move seamlessly to the topic of gay sex. You've publicly stated that you're not a fan. No doubt about that. And you categorically claim that you've never partaken in the act. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I can remember those times very well. And I can remember stories about tensions between different people and the Prime Minister. Uh, to be clear, what do you mean by that? I know some gay people extremely well. Just how well are we talking here? There are lots of terrific uh, gay relationships. Sounds like you've been having a really great time. I must say, I wasn't expecting this at all. Our initial reactions to some of these things can be far from perfect. Would you say you're more of a bottom? So that is absolutely my position. But with all of this talk of sexual deviance taking place, are you taking precautions? I'm being tested every day. Great news. Final question. It seems you rate yourself as a gifted lover. And I think uh, that people who know me well, who are gay, would be only too happy to testify to that. Tony Abbott, thanks for joining me on The Herd Mentality. It's lovely to be here. Uh, Lots of terrific uh, commitments uh, between gay partners. Now, can you hear everything through that? Is that too loud? It's perfect. Computer's picking everything up nicely. (sighs) Let's see how this goes. Peter, this is where you put your phone down and and pay attention to what's going on. Good idea. Is everyone excited? You can feel the feel the music. Yeah. Do you reckon I should try and do a, a backup harmony with the with me? Let's see how it goes. Welcome to the Herd Mentality Podcast, an eclectic non-weekly mix of atheistic, humanistic, and scientific conversations with complete strangers. I've never met them and they've never met me, but we're throwing caution to the wind, taking a risk with a dodgy internet connection, and God willing, entertain you with some scintillating repartee. This is a listener-supported show, and you can help boost quality and quantity at HerdMentalityPodcast.com, and then click on support. Your contribution makes all the difference for the show, and 10% of it goes to women in developing countries. I'm your host, Questionable Adam, found on Twitter, Facebook and Google+. And it's time to meet our guests. There we go. Awkward pause. Did I leave it just long enough? I'm joined live in front of real people with Peter Bogosian. Peter, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Now, we're also joined by Ray Comfort. And normally at the beginning of the show's I do these little snippets. We did have something planned. Peter was going to interview Tony Abbott and reveal some of the questionable practices that perhaps he has um, going on down under, as it were. (laughs) But uh, instead, tonight we've had to settle for somebody uh, far less popular than Tony Abbott, (laughs) if such a thing is possible. We've got Ray Comfort. Well, I'm very excited to uh, speak to Ray this evening, and I'm glad you're here. And Ray, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Adam, I love you, and God bless you. And- well, th- thank you, Ray. And if it's okay with you, I would like to interview you, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be asking you a series of questions about homosexuality. Homosexuality, 
Yeah, homosexuality and maybe lesbianism too. Lesbianism. Yeah, and we're going to talk about a wide range. We're going to talk about a wide range of issues. Can you take a guess, uh, perhaps, of what other things we're going to talk about? Fornication, adultery, pornography. Wow, Ray, that's that's actually pretty impressive. Wasn't that impressive, Adam? He's all across it. Yeah, that's good. So, actually, one of the things that that uh, I, I wanted to say b- before I I start, I just wanted to. <laughs> I just wanted to say that it's a it's a true honor to interview you today and to to have you here and I'd like to thank you for coming on the Herd Mentality podcast and it re- means a lot to me. Homosexuality? Yes, okay. Thank you, Ray. We're going to get into that issue right now. Now, I've heard that you've slept with many many men. Is this true? Absolutely. Given that you're a rabid homophobe, how do you reconcile the fact that you that you sleep and have sex with men with the fact that you uh, vociferously campaign against homosexuals? I can't sleep at night. Adam, did you want to have add anything? I'll, I'll have a quick word with Ray, if you don't mind. Ray, did you find anything confronting about uh, what Peter had to ask you? Or? I don't find it offensive. Not offensive at all. But tonight, what, what do you think about the turnout? I find it very disappointing. Well... <laughs> I don't know. We've actually had quite a few people from Sydney turn up. Uh, Well, this is just the beginning. Final question. Uh, Tonight's interview with Peter, uh, how's it going to have an impact on the world at large? It's going to leave a deep impression on the mind of Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins. Very well. Back to you, Peter. Well, thank you very much. Now, Ray, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, do you find anything wrong with uh, homosexuality? No. There you have it. But I just want to be clear, for the record, you have had homosexual sex with many men. Is that is that true? That's right. And you're positive about that? Absolutely. Well, great. Thank you very much, Ray. Would you have any final uh, comments? Homosexuality... Yeah, anything else? Thanks for talking to me. My pleasure. All right, goodbye, Ray. Thank you. Homosexuality. What a top guy. He's really taken one for the team there. (laughs) 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 So last night, in fact, several of you were at Peter's talk. This was held in the city, which is far more accessible than where we are right now in this backwards third world country town called Ride. It's a ride. I'm a local. They love me. (laughs) And Peter, you were talking about de-radicalizing jihadis, and yet you're still here today. I am. I think one of the reasons is because we changed the title of the talk. Instead of jihadis, we we took out jihadis and we put in extremists instead. Once we got into it, it was all about the jihadis. How's the talk? Because it's the second time you've done the talk, I understand. How's it gone down? I went out, I put it out first time at RNR 5 in Canada. And unfortunately, the talk should have been up, but there were, were technical issues, technological issues that took the talk down. But hopefully, We'll be getting that talk up again, but it's been exceptionally well received by people across the spectrum. And as I said last night, it really is the only talk I've ever done in which I expect the adamant support of Christians. Yeah, right. Well, to be able to get them on, uh, to win the Christian vote, <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> you're doing quite well in Australia. Yeah, so there's the thing. The, the only people who want more jihadis are other jihadis. Every other person, not religious or not, Nobody wants more jihadis. So if people are trying to figure out how to navigate these thorny, complex, and politically charged issues of how to have fewer jihadis. And that's really the money question. And no, the, the fact is that nobody really knows how to do that. I was cruising on the interwebs the other day, and there's a, a website called Patheos. And they had a, an article up about, there's a fundraiser, there's a couple of Christian sites that are doing Bibles for Iraq. And it occurred to me that that's exactly what Iraq needs <laughs> for, for a place that has been devastated by religion. The only solution to this problem is um, <laughs> more religion. <laughs> it's a bit like the guns issue over in the States as well. Australia, we don't have that problem. What's it been like walking around here and not seeing people with a six-shooter strapped to their hip? You know, it, it really is f- funny... When I give talks, and all kidding aside is true, when I give talks in the States, I really am worried that someone's going to shoot me. In fact, when I spoke in the Deep South, I had to sign an indemnity waiver in case I was assassinated on campuses. So it's interesting. It's a very freeing feeling. And whenever I go to my kids' school, I often think about that. Oh, geez, you know, one one lunatic with a gun could really take down the whole place. Mm. 
and they have the kids do drills, these emergency drills. Yeah. The kids in Australia, we, we have them do sport. Right. No, we're, we don't have that yet. <laughs> we're still stuck on the deranged lunatic with guns. Interestingly, the NRA solution, the National Rifle Association, their solution to this problem is that they want people with guns stationed in every elementary and high school and middle school in the entire country. Could you imagine that? That's their solution. It's not a solution. No, it, it, it's not a solution. And in, in fact, uh, Sean Faircloth and Sam Harris had an exchange a couple years ago about guns. And I think the, co- the problem is more complicated than people realize. And I just mentioned to Steve from the Sydney Atheist, it's not as simple as just asking people to turn in their guns. We have the Second Amendment. We have other complicating issues. I will say that that's one thing that every single person in Australia, as I mentioned today, has wanted to talk to me about, gu- guns. Yeah. It's an amendment for that reason. It was amended. It can be amended. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. Unfortunate. Unfortunate for the kiddies. So who are you? What, what, why are you doing this? Why are you putting your balls on the line? In top ride? <laughs> it's... <laughs> Just getting past security, and here's a big job. No, for I mean, you've got kids, you've got a wife, you've got a dog. Two, two dogs. Why are you doing all of this? Is it a bit like me, where I think that perhaps somebody might listen to this and perhaps something good might come of it? I think it's a combination of things. I think I saw a problem that had a solution that was pretty obvious to me. A long time ago, I was telling my dad when I was in graduate school, oh, I wanted to do something about the environment, and there was a local charity on campus and I was thinking of stuffing envelopes and my dad said, what do you want to stuff envelopes for? Anybody can stuff envelopes. Why don't you take your skill set? Why don't you write something for them? Or why don't you take your skill set and apply that in a meaningful way? So I was kind of thinking about that and that was meaningful to me. One of the things that I had thought that that may be helpful is to help people understand that they're valuing the wrong things, that the things they value aren't leading them to the truth. I realized over time that it's not a very complicated process. It just doesn't take very long to do. And with a minimal amount of effort, you could help a tremendous number of people. And make no mistake about it, as you know, atheism is a slow financial bleed. I mean, I I make no money from it. I mean, really, I I mean, I have seen Australia, which has been awesome. But it's not exactly what you do to make money. You know, it's not, it's not, not a living, as you know that. No, if you were to do... If you're really serious about making money, you'd have your teeth done and go and work for Joel Osteen. Yeah, and guys like that who have 3 million Twitter followers, who make tens of millions of dollars a year, or Deepak Chopra who gets paid an exorbitant amount of money per each showing. I mean, these guys are worsening the human condition. They're driving people into delusion, and they're getting rich as a result. I'm getting threats and death threats and have high stress levels and, and bleeding money because I want to help people. And unlike a, a, a real doctor, like a medical doctor, when you help somebody, your patients thank you. I'm trying to help people not live lives of delusion, and they're stressing me out about it. Like I'm kind of some kind of a, a demon. I mean, people have accused me of being a devil or something. I mean, it's just, you know, so I mean, I'm doing it because I think I think I can make a difference. I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think I can make a difference. Or if I thought I could make a difference and it turned out I wasn't making a difference, then I would stop doing what I'm doing and I'd stuff envelopes or something. So how does all this go down at home with the family? What sort of impact is this having on them? She didn't want me to do the jihadi talk. But you went ahead and did it regardless, and it was good. There's a difference between talking to Christians who are upset with you and having people who actually want to saw off your head, right? I mean, th- th- those are... Those are not those are not minor differences, and so while I have received credible threats, they never really bothered me too much, you know. Especially since I saw my mom die of cancer, and I didn't want to die of cancer. I forget that be that wouldn't be actually too bad of a death. Someone comes up from behind you and blows your head off with a shotgun. That, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be too bad. Certainly better than dying for cancer. The, but the jihadi thing, you know, we talked about it, and we talked about what that would mean. It's just a new level of seriousness, engaging people who have an orientation to the world that is so destructive and so inconceivable to the Western mind that it's something that I thought about. And eventually we talked about it. And, you know, she said, are you sure this is what you want to do? And I said, yeah, this is what I want to do. And so, but I've always been very respectful of Islam. I don't show pictures of the Muslim prophet Muhammad. I, and I was very, very, very ultra specific that I targeted one, I targeted Islamism and not Islam. And I've always been very respectful of Muslims, and my Muslim students have been very respectful of me, and so uh, I think it's fine. I hope it's fine. There was a rumor that you're involved somewhat in creating some policy in Australia. Am I allowed to discuss this? No, that's a no, so moving right along. Lovely weather today. (laughs) 
So I'm going to hopefully help contribute to secular policies, prayers when they're allowed. We in the U.S. we call that separation of church and state. So I've always wanted to do something like that in the U.S. And as you know, we have a, a very vociferous religious. It used to be a majority. Now, hopefully, they're a minority. But in this country, I I actually have an app- opportunity to make some potential legislative changes. And that's like been a dream of mine for a long, long time. Where to now? You're finishing up your your trip in Australia. Heading Newcastle, which should be awesome. I'm going to see my my friend Russell Blackford and give a talk there. Heading to Auckland, New Zealand. I've always wanted to see New Zealand. Have a few semi-private talks in New Zealand. Going to hang out there for a little while. And then I'm going to go home and I'm going to go on family vacation. And I'm not going to answer email or do any work at all. And life is going to be good. And then I'm going to start working like a maniac again when that's done. Let's talk a little bit about some real work that you did. The book, A Manual for Creating Atheists. Who's read it here? Yeah, that's, well, that's half the room. <laughs> You're a popular guy, Peter. Half the room. <laughs> So 50% of these people don't know how to create atheists is when mummy and daddy love each other in a very special way. And then they don't force their beliefs upon a child. <laughs> I've been pondering something. I read the book, listened to the audio book, loved it. But one thing stuck out, like the proverbial the dog's genitals, and that was the description of faith as a virus. <laughs> Whilst it's apt and it resonates with me... I don't think this is a wonderful way of encouraging new people into the fold. So why do it? Uh, it spreads like a virus. You can look at it as an epidemiological contagion. It acts like a virus, like a mimetic virus. In interventions with people, very rarely do I actually tell them that it's a virus. If they ask me, I'll tell them. Which I always tell people the truth when they ask me. But I don't recommend that in specific interventions. So before, when you were talking about atheists, I think the key of how to create atheists if that's even something we want to do, is that we need to encourage people to be more honest and reflective about their beliefs. And so the question about creating atheists, I think, is really more of a question of self-honesty. Do you really believe there was a talking snake and a guy who walked on water, or do you want to believe that? What do you will, Have you bartered your wish to find out for your will to believe? But the term virus. <laughs> okay. What's wrong with the virus? What's wrong with virus? It spreads like a virus. If we went to Mars, right, this is where it gets a little weird, but if all Bibles and digital copies of Bibles were to be destroyed from the world, that would never rise again. I mean, you couldn't find me one tribe, of course, now you couldn't, but, you know, a 100 years ago, isolated in the middle of nowhere, who had the revelation of Jesus Christ or the Holy Testament or the Holy Spirit. I mean, you don't, the whole concept of how that replicates mimetically and through these institutions like churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, these places are like contagion centers that pass on the viruses. And our governments enable these centers by giving them tax-exempt status. So it really does replicate like a virus. I, I find no... Now, if you're telling me the analogy, it's disanalogous, then I'd like to hear why. If you're telling me it's not a good strategy, that we could have that conversation. But I think being blunt about that and honest is the way to deal with it. And often, you know, particularly with people who have some apologetics training or thought about this stuff, all you need to do is you just need to switch to a different faith, like Mormonism. It really does. That really is how it replicates. All right. I'll grant it. <laughs> <laughs> so you have no problem with so you have no problem with the book then. No, but I can put the shoe on the other foot. If it had been Ray Comfort who'd written the book about how to create more Christians and he used the term atheism synonymously with education because I think that's possibly fair. <laughs> <laughs> Some more homosexuality there from Ray, thank you. And that book was out there. That, 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 this is not no, no, no. a good way to, no, no, no. to encourage me to, to switch. Oh, yeah. That's, again, if you use it in, in an intervention. So I just heard recently that... So a lot of the people who do street epistemology walk up to random people on the street and say, may I ask you, may I talk to you about your God beliefs? And they have timers and they say it's going to be five, five ten minutes... And then they have conversations with people about their God beliefs. I just found out the other day that Christians have started adopting this technique. And they will walk up to people and say, may I talk to you about your God beliefs? And, you know, I don't know most people because that's a numeric thing. But, you know, a lot of people say, sure. But what they do is they don't ask them how they know what they know. They give them their own testimony. That's how it replicates because our brains are wired to be 
more susceptible to testimony than they are to evidence, particularly peer-reviewed evidence is a relatively recent phenomenon, right? Peer-reviewed journals and evidence, et cetera. So people, so you know, you said if Ray Comfort wrote that book, but it doesn't work like that. It's like someone said to me, can you use these techniques to change the football team that someone roots for? Well, no. I mean, you could try, but it doesn't work that way because it only works that way if someone makes a knowledge claim. You can't use these techniques if someone says that they don't like pepperoni on their pizza, they like anchovies. Now, there's some people in the audience tonight who are of interest to me. One's Martin. (laughs) And I'd like to invite you up to take my spot and have a chat with Peter about what you do and some of the volunteer work you've done because I think that's interesting. Would you like to drive this thing? (laughs) Let's see how we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin. Thank you, Adam. Just to introduce myself, I'm nobody special. Uh, just on Twitter, at Martin Bores, M-A-R-T-I-N-B-O-E-R-S. Uh, so thanks for inviting me up. Welcome, Peter. Actually, just to, to carry on from one of your questions there, Adam, I had another problem with your book, <laughs> which I'd like to, to ask you about. Uh, I think, Peter, you you were saying in the book that you would maybe go into a church and sit in the pews and speak to people in, in the church or wait outside a church, if I remember rightly. It was a while ago when I read the book and maybe chat to them outside the church in a similar way to what the street preachers do maybe on the corner of Castle Ray Street and Market Street in the middle of Sydney, the Scientologists or, or, or maybe the Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on the door. Do you think that's an effective way to just get in people's faces without any, any invitation? Is that an effective way, do you think, to approach people? I don't get in anybody's face. One thing you will find about people of faith is they love to talk about their faith. And that makes two of us. Because I love to talk about their faith too. So I don't get in anybody's faith, anybody's faith. Now, now we happen to have the president of the Sydney Atheist sitting here with us. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Christians and Muslims and Hindus are more than welcome to come to the Sydney Atheist. Is that not correct? Uh, he said absolutely. And his name is Steve Martin. He said, you see him shaking. The- so at the Sydney Atheist, you, you were religious and you'd like to come here. Absolutely, the doors are open for you. And I, the other thing I found is Christians and Muslims, they're more than people in the temple, the Baha'is, they're more than likely. They, they love having me in there, and I love going in there. So uh, I wouldn't say I'm in anybody's face. I'm there to listen, and I listen, and then I conduct an intervention. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, so Adam mentioned that I do some volunteer work. Um, up until fairly recently, uh, I was a volunteer with New South Wales Primary Ethics, and that's an organisation, just as a bit of background. The New South Wales education system originally was formed as uh, secular, compulsory and free. They were the three tenets that the, the, well, the Australian education system was based on. A, a couple of decades ago, the uh, religious people sort of gradually started uh, making inroads into our primary schools and our secondary schools and they managed to get uh, special religious instruction or special religious education uh, established and, in fact, legislated for in New South Wales schools or in, 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 in each state, in fact. So uh, what that means is that for half an hour every week in primary schools, by law, there's a half hour set aside in, in public schools where religious people can come in and proselytise, well, I'm sorry, educate our children about their faith. The only option up until recently for children who didn't want to participate in this religious instruction or religious education was to uh, do non-scripture, to basically sit out. There was no learning allowed or no teaching allowed during that half hour. The children basically had nothing to do during that time. So a few years ago, about five years ago, an organisation called New South Wales Primary Ethics was set up and they managed to get the law changed so that uh, during that half hour of scripture in New South Wales schools, there was also an option now of doing philosophical ethics where children could be could engage in discussions about ethical issues in a non-religious uh, environment. Now, that was legislated for several years ago. That's been going on for a few years, and it's completely voluntary run. There's about 1,000, 1,200 volunteers at this stage uh, facilitating ethics education classes in New South Wales. Unfortunately, recently, because a party called the Christian Democratic Party, uh, I'd like to call them the Christian Theocratic Party, uh, has the balance of power in our upper house here in New South Wales, they've managed to get primary ethics removed from the enrolment forms in New South Wales. So just wondering, Peter, you know, if you think there's a role for philosophical ethics in schools, um, whether you think that's uh, a a way of 
combating the faith virus uh, from a young age, or whether there's something similar in the United States or in other countries you visited? Well, there's a lot there. Okay, so the, the, the first thing is, I guess I, have, I take issue with the term education when you say it's religious education. But to answer your question directly, the problem is that people could then sneak their own particular delusions into that ethical curricula. So you'd need some kind of a stand, even if you had a standard, this is what this, you know, Hume or Bentley or Mill, whoever, Aristotle, Plato, even if you did that, the problem is that you would still have people, and we're all people, teaching those things. And my guess would be that those people would be far more likely to be religious than not. And they would try to sneak in their own particular delusions to that. That's interesting you say that because the curriculum for special religious education in New South Wales is not vetted by the Department of Education. So they can effectively teach whatever they like, present whatever the material they like. And in recent months, there's been, you know, exposures of the types of material that they're teaching, you know, abstinence education, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, but that's the whole point. Absence of, you said education, and then you said absence education. We know that the data is clear on that. I can't speak for Australia, but I don't see why it wouldn't be generalizable. We know that the data, those actually not, not only does it not work, it actually increases pregnancies. And if someone's listening to that and they're a Christian and you're against abortion, it increases abortion. So it's not what you should be teaching people. Unless somehow you've made the privilege of, you, you've privileged Premar not having premarital sex over abortion. I don't know any Christian has done that. I'd just like to take this opportunity to have a shout out to my good friend Sarah Palin, uh, who's about to become a grandmother for the second time. So well done. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's a that's a great example. I mean, it's it's uh, an N of one, but we, right, uh, there's one person in that. But I, I don't I don't I well two now additional people. Yeah, but that's not how reality works. And, and if your ideology doesn't comport with the evidence, then you have to drop your ideology. Yeah, well, the, the argument when uh, people raise the question, why can't the Department of Education vet the scripture program or curriculum that's being presented to kids? And a famous answer from one of the scripture organisations was, well, how could the Department of Education vet it? They're not theologians. I just thought that was a crazy answer. <laughs> yeah, so I think... One way to combat this, one way to think about this is, I'm not joking when I say this, I'm very serious. You need to have legitimate, bona fide devil worshippers. You need to find these people and you need to have them go in there and teach the kids that. That's the type of education that, if you really want that, then everybody has a voice. And then we'll see what people start saying. Look, I think we might be able to conscript everybody here tonight into a bit of devil worship. Just pick up the book on the way out and we'll <laughs> get you across it. But uh, really quickly, there's one thing that I, I wanted to raise, and Peter, you may not be aware of this, but there's been a change to the way that the forms are filled out. So when a child goes to school, there is now no longer the option to tick a box for ethics education. They have to, I think, divide by zero, work out, <laughs> send something off, via carrier pigeon, and it's very convoluted to be able to get your child into these uh, ethics classes that Martin teaches voluntarily. So Dan Dennett talks about this, and I actually disagree with him. I understand his impetus, but I think it's misguided. His claim is that we need to teach comparative religions. But the problem with that is the type of people who would teach comparative religions would, I was going to say shit all over, but you probably can't say that. You can edit that out. Shit all over other religions while lauding their religions. So you got to remember, what people don't understand is it's like, and I've been in the education business a long time, it's not about stats or anything, or I don't like this, it's about the teacher. If you have a really good teacher, you'll get turned on to a subject. It's one of the reasons I love, I got into teaching philosophy. If you have a really good teacher, it's called the Dr. Fox effect, if you want to Google it. If you have somebody who's animated and passionate, et cetera, et cetera, then those kids, those students in that class, that will resonate with them. And so you need to be really careful because it's like a Trojan horse that gets into people's beliefs. It's interesting that you raise the, the concern that perhaps the ethics teachers may have another agenda and they may sneak in their you know, biases or, or delusions into the curriculum. Just so that you know, the New South Wales primary ethics curriculum is very strictly scripted. And the volunteers who facilitate these ethics classes must follow the script to the letter. 
now, whether they do or not. There's auditors who come in to audit the classes, but really you're supposed to follow the script to the letter. So you present a, a scenario to the, the students and you ask them questions that follow the Socratic method. Is it always wrong to keep a secret? Um, how do we create a fair society? Exploring faith and belief and respect these sorts of things. So it's very heavily scripted. So there is really, in theory, no opportunity to deviate from that curriculum, which is completely secular. Okay. So if the idea is that it's descriptive rather than evaluative, then someone say, well, you know, according to this ethical theory, according to this person, how do we deal with this question? So if, if it's just a descriptive response to that, I don't know. Is it useful? I don't know. Maybe it's useful, I guess. But if it's evaluative, that's different. Yeah, it is. It's not the, 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 the history of philosophy or the theory of philosophy. It's actually, I mean, the kids don't even know. They don't, you don't talk about Hume. You don't talk about Heidegger or anything like that. It's purely scenarios, philosophical scenarios. The kids don't even know they're doing philosophical ethics. They're just presented with scenarios. We even touched on free will last year um, with the example of Voldemort from uh, Harry Potter. <laughs> Was he, you know, responsible for his actions. Uh, now, the kids didn't know they were discussing free will or, or anything to do with philosophy or ethics, but, you know, they had the conversation about to what degree was Voldemort responsible for his actions. Now, that was just brilliant to me to see 11 and 12-year-old kids effectively getting into a conversation about free will without even realising it. That was magic to me. Again, I don't know the particular context, but if the question is should philosophy be taught, my response, maybe you'll be surprised by this, is it depends. Just because it's philosophy, it doesn't mean it's going to help people learn to think or make their ideas clear. There's a lot of horrible philosophy. You'd have to look at the curriculum, and more than that, you'd have to scrutinize the individuals who teach that. But I don't know how you could do that because there are other legislative, I would imagine, and judicial constraints to that. Yeah, I, I think it's a thorny issue, curriculum and cur – you know, in the United States, school boards, every time someone runs for a school board, those are always the, the h most contested – Whereas, you know, other issues like, you know, 20 people run for the school board, but no one runs for the water board or the sewer board. I mean, people just don't run for that stuff. It's just not sexy or they're not interested, et cetera. You were talking about uh, visiting different campuses, universities, and having threats in, in various parts of the country. So you must talk all over the country, all over the world. Have you ever run up against free speech issues. It, it seems like more and more in American institutions and, and in Europe as well. I don't think so much in Australia yet. But there is this move from left-wing groups, organisations, students' unions and so on, uh, being afraid to let people like yourself talk on campus in case they upset sensibilities. Have you come across that much and, and had any problems with free speech? Yeah, all the time. Oh, you want more? <laughs> yeah, all the time. I came up at, against it at my own university when I wanted to do the Jesus, the Easter Bunny, and other delusions talk, and the talk went through, and the people who complained were leftists. And are there a handful of Christians who complain about my talks? Yeah, absolutely. Are there a handful of Muslims who complain about my talks? F fewer. And then there's the fringe splinter religious groups. But most of the people who complain about my talks and my appearances in my debates are, are overwhelmingly on the left. Thank you. Thank you, Morton. That was marvelous. Joining us now, we've got at Sekuhum. Pull up a microphone. Make yourself at home. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mr. Bogosian, love your work. Big fan of your book. I greatly appreciate it. Um, it's been really encouraging to see some people take the idea or the concept of street epistemology to the actual street. I think it's a gentleman by the name of uh, Anthony Magna Bosco or Magna Bosca. Apologize, Anthony. He has and I suppose some other street epistemologists have received some criticism specifically from the Christian right or at least straight from the pulpit and I'm not sure whether or not you've actually seen any of that yourself. How do you take that? Yeah, do you have any reflection on the uh, resistance to the method that's being applied in the street? So, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay? So I think what you're talking about is these guys said it's like a knockout game, is that what you're saying? And... and uh yeah, so basically a knockout game is if someone's just walking by you on the street, boom! Sorry about that, I mean it's pretty real. But you just punch them in the face and you knock them out. And so basically they think that asking people questions about why they believe what they believe is akin to a knockout game. That just goes to show that the beliefs they have are under evidenced and all this talk about critical thinking is bullshit. These people, they're being dishonest and insincere. Look, to go down a little bit of a pathway here take a view on your question. If you were 
really convinced that your religion is true and you really valued critical thinking, you wouldn't need to teach anybody about your religion. You just teach them critical thinking and they'd come to conclusions about their religion on your own. But they don't do that. I think what Anthony's doing is absolutely fantastic. Socrates Jones, a whole bunch of other folks have started walking up to random people on the street and asking about their faith and helping them become more honest and more reflective and instilling doubt in people. And I've actually received emails, not just from the people with whom they've engaged, but from other people who have then, in, who have they that have then engaged, thanking me and thanking Anthony and thanking these folks for really talking them out of delusions or getting them thinking about this stuff. That's awesome. But a throwback to Adam. Thanks, Peter. Very well. And final question, I think, from Steve Martin from Sydney Atheist, president, founder, hero. Any other criteria? What else have I forgotten? <laughs> Steve. Very kind and very overrated. Thank you, Adam. Peter, uh, since you've been in Australia, I-, I just wonder, have you actually had an intervention with an Australian? And if you have, how did it go? Yeah, I did. I was very, very fortunate to have. Unf- my my big lament is that this was not taped. It was. I was in Adelaide, and I was in the Q and A, and I had a whole bunch of people in the Q and A, and I thought I was just about to leave and go get drinks and eat, and then I had somebody from the Christian some Christian society. I performed an intervention, and it was interesting, and I can tell you about it quickly if you want to know. And then right after him, I had a Muslim come up. And both of these guys were 100% confident in their faith, like absolutely positive. So one thing I used to say to Muslims was, how is it possible that Muhammad could be the last prophet and Joseph Smith, who claimed to come after him, the Mormons believe he's a prophet, how is that possible? But they started equivocating on the word prophet. And I realized that only the although it's a not really the right term, a fundamentalist Muslim, or the more hardcore would say it. So I no longer use that. Instead, I've switched to this strategy. In the Quran, there's a very specific reference to the fact that the Quran is the revelations of Muhammad given by the Archangel Gabriel from God. It's very explicit, you can Google it if you want, that Jesus was not crucified. The core Christian belief is that Jesus was crucified. So I said to the Muslim guy in the audience, do you believe Jesus was crucified? He said, no. I said, how confident are you in that belief? That's the key right there. Completely confident. I said to the Christian guy, do you believe Jesus was crucified? He said, yes. I said, how confident are you in that belief? He said, completely confident. I was like, hey, you guys have a talk with each other, figure it out, but you can't invoke faith. (laughs) Did they come back to you? Yeah, so the other thing I said was I made a prediction to everybody in front of everybody that within 24 hours, both of those guys would email me and want further conversation. I was wrong. It was about eight hours. I got emails from both of those guys. wanting, And I told them the truth. You should not be talking to me. You should be talking to somebody who has parallel delusions. Like, you, you, it's not helpful for you to talk to me. You need to see what you're up against, the type of brainwashing you've encountered by talking to somebody. When somebody has a delusion, they don't perceive it as a delusion. So how can you then go and find somebody who has a parallel non-existent delusion? So there are many ways that you can look at that question. There's a wonderful little paper. I've been drinking, so I can't remember the name of it, but like the three Jesuses. Anybody remember that? Yeah, it's basically these three guys who think that they're Jesus. They put them in a room. They put them in a room together and they just have them talk to each other. Among the things that you can do is each person will be adamant that their faith tradition is correct. One of the things that can come out, can come out if it's facilitated correctly, is that people can understand the role of faith in their belief system and what that means to have faith, which is basically to extend the confidence in a belief beyond the warrant of the evidence. And that's why Christian apologists have switched to the word trust, which is basically a placeholder that just pushes it one link down the epistemic chain. So I think it's incredibly useful for those people to engage in dialogues. Look, that's because why you always see, or very frequently you see debates between Christians and atheists and Muslims and atheists, etc. But you very rarely see debates between Christians and Muslims. It's just to stick within the Abrahamic traditions. You never see, I, at least I've never seen, maybe you more internet savvy, debates between like Hindus and Christians. And those are the sorts of things we need to see. Because other people need, it's a variation of John W. Loftus's Outsider Test for Faith. 
people need to see that both of these people are trapped in delusional belief systems. Oh, and one more thing. As an intervention, here's a question that I use. First thing you need to do is you need to ascertain how confident somebody is in the belief. Then you have to say, you can either, you've read the book, you can either give them Matt McCormick's defeasibility test. So, so they say to you, they're, they're completely confident. And here's the definite, the difference between being delusional, which Adam was your question, and misconstruing reality. If you just misconstrue reality, it means you're wrong. And embedded within that is if you were shown to be in error, you would correct your beliefs. Delusional people are less likely to revise their beliefs. It's still possible that that's true. But that's a difference between a delusion and misconstruing reality. Thank you very much, Peter. I'll uh, hand over Adam. Uh, but just uh, on behalf of everybody, Peter, it's been uh, a delight having you here. Indeed it has. Indeed it has. So, guys, half of you had read the book. Who hasn't? All right, well, you're here with a partner. There's a signed copy from Peter, courtesy of Peter, at his own expense. That'll be $70. Who else? You haven't read it? That's yours as well. So, Peter, thank you very, very much. It's been a blast. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's been wonderful to be here. I, I would like, with your permission, to ask... Thanks for talking to me. Ray, if you'd like to add anything tonight. Homosexuality. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Well, this is just the beginning. <laughs> Guys, thanks for coming. That flew. Here's a tweet by Chris Krzmenski. I am God, and I was born from the same human creativity that saw bears and hunters with drawn bows in the patterns of the stars. Follow Chris at C.E.K. Books and grab his latest work, All These Quiet Places, a collaboration with Jen August about domestic violence on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Heard a mentalist, hear me. Just a quick word of thanks to those who support the show at patreon.com slash herdmentality. These fine people are Tammy, Cliff and Philip. Not only did they support the show, 10% of their money and that of the other supporters went to Kiva.org to help women in developing countries to further their education. Tay in Vietnam, Thalamalu in Samoa, Tok Token in Kyrgyzstan and Cindy in Colombia were all able to receive support this week as previous loans were partially repaid. Thanks for helping make this possible. Also thanks to the Herd Mentalists who made it to the live recording with Peter Bogosian and a special thanks to those who bought me beer. Like I said, just a quick word. Take care, everyone. Speak soon. Smiley face. So I'm standing here in the kitchen whilst it rains with Peter Bogosian after our chat. Peter, we changed someone's... I know. That was intense, right? That was intense. What did we change? Uh, What did we change? Don't give names, but... No, I'm, I don't know if we change something. I, I don't. I don't know how to. Just, we, we why help. don't we describe it? Why okay. Why you, you, don't, no, I'm self conscious about mean, describing it. What do you mean, we white man? I'm just. <laughs> I'm just. I'm self conscious. I'm, I'm not. I'm just self conscious about describing. You describe it. So after the show, somebody came up to us and said that they'd not been out of the house for for a social event for eighteen months. Yeah. This was a positive thing. This person came because this person saw your name and my name, and she said, wow, that would be something I think I could open up to. That would be something I think I could be myself around in those gatherings. That would be something I think, a place where I could feel comfortable with people who would accept me. Mm. Yeah. And she did a champion job tonight. So. Yeah, she did an awesome job. So. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, she did an awesome job. I mean, that's yeah. a huge deal, not being out of the house in 18 months. And then We know you're listening. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. You're awesome. <laughs>